The most awkward thing is actually having a wow. T Fury Star Wars shirt and then going into work at Lucasfilm. And <laughs> my wife is like, "If you're seeing George today, you might not want to wear that Tuscan Raider shirt that he's not making any money off of." So, yeah, and George what? Lucas tends to be the litigious type when it comes to that kind of stuff. Oh, he's so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> he's a nice guy. What is the oh, Lucas sorry. project that you're working on? Is it an, 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 they an gave animated? Me, they gave me a page and a half of what I couldn't couldn't say. The place is so run by lawyers. It's just insane. So, um, I can say it's all CGI. Okay. I can say it's not Star Wars. So da, the da, 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 da. Can, gave you a <laughs> can you say who's working with you? For uh, I can say that I have um, Sarah MacArthur as my producer, and she's she's amazing. And she used to run uh, production of Pixar and Disney, and she's she's great. And um, and uh, and then David Barenbaum is the writer on it, and he wrote Elf and did one draft on Spiderwick, I think, as well. And so he's, he's he's doing a bunch of stuff. So very funny guy. So. Uh, I don't know. We just have to wait and see. Aliens or fairies or anything. No, it's everything. That's yeah, crazy. All I know is that there was that leak last year in the press, and then all of a sudden, uh, it all went away. No. <laughs> and then George it's said, "Don't to, worry about it's it." Time and I was like, oh, "You're right. I'm not worrying about it." It's time to bring it all back to No. Or you could do the mind trick on us. Yeah, exactly. That's what. Yeah. You didn't Everybody hear any of this, this news. <laughs> exactly. Right. It's so funny. Yeah. I got him to quote you out to me the other day. What was the appeal of uh, Dylan Dog for you? Why did you want to do this? Uh, I just, to me, it was, hey. Okay. hey. Hi. I'm, you know, they had me Glad waiting outside did. for the past minutes, so I'm sorry I was late. Told you, like I said. Um, so, yeah, uh, it, it, Dylan Dog was just everything I loved about movies growing up. I, I just have so many fond memories of watching, um, you know, An American Werewolf in London, like with my dad, and both of us were laughing and being scared and all that stuff, and that I just really am attracted to that kind of stuff. Like stuff like Fright Night and Monster Squad, you know, all those, like, these are just things that were just my bread and butter growing up, and so getting this project was um, something that was created in the 80s, and so it had that 80s flavor to it already, but it was like, how do you take that and adapt it to, you know, sort of modern day audiences? Because when you look at the majority of, like, teenagers or even college kids that are you know, going to be watching the movie. I mean, they, they just, they've never seen all that stuff. And so there's, there's, a, there's a world to them that it's almost like more realistic to have this giant CG thing that everybody knows is fake as opposed to a really great character actor in, in, in a monster costume. And to me, I love the costume stuff. I'd much rather, I buy that that's there. I know my actors buy that that's there because they're in the same room with it. They're not sitting there in front of a silver ball that they're like, it's going to be this amazing thing. You just wait. And so really, but whenever, the, like, for instance, the tattooed zombie came on set, it was played by Brian Steele, who's been... He was the lead Predator in the Predators remake and just everything, Hellboy stuff. And he comes out, and he's like seven and a half, eight feet, and he walks out, and he dwarfs Brandon. I mean, it just really makes an impact, and everybody knows, like, this guy's going to kick the crap out of you today. And, right. and it's just, it's great, so. How familiar are you with the source material before taking it? Um, I had actually um, developed a TV series um, uh, based on Martin Mystery um, for Dark Horse Comics at the time, when they were trying to, to launch that. And, uh, and I found six English issues that they had um, in their... Uh, in there, uh, on, just on a coffee table. And so I picked up, I read it, and it had everything I loved. It had like the detective story, it had the greatest role in the lead, it had monsters, it had, you know, just a, a sense of humor on top of it. And so um, seven years later, after I'd finished uh, Ninja Turtles, uh, I was figuring out, and, and the Gotcha Man movie I was doing, it sort of falling apart. I bet you this is sloshing, and I'm like, I should really stop. <laughs> um, and uh, and, and uh, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next, and someone sent me a script called Dead of Night, and I flipped in ten pages. I called to the producer I was like dude is this a Dylan Dog movie and he was like yeah why didn't you tell me this is I would have I would have gotten to it a lot faster and uh, and so uh, I read it and two minutes later I called him back and I just said I just really need to do this movie and went in there for three hours with storyboards and character designs and creature designs and clips from other movies and just pitched my guts out and luckily they, they fell for it <laughs> so. uh, I saw the suit I mean the jacket uh, something you know nods to the comic yeah. uh what else should we be looking for? Oh my gosh, there's so many things in there. Um, it's really funny because you, you go to an Italian site and they'll tell you the 60 things that aren't in the movie. But you go to a site that I would be involved with and I would show you the 150 that are in there. But it's, um, we, the costuming stuff is there. He drives a bug. It's white in the comic book. It's black in our movie. Ooh. And I, it's, I, you, hey, you don't make fun of it. I've had threats of so many things getting shoved up in places. And it, <laughs> it's bad um, uh, because of white and black. Um, and so uh, we've got that. We've got um, his sidekick is in Groucho, which is in the comic book. But um, that was that would have been like a hefty seven-figure uh, uh, decision to put that in. 
And I think it would have been distracting, personally, as an audience member, because I don't think Groucho Marx has that same sort of... Um, has that same sort of uh, impact in, in an Italian comic book as it would on an American film. Because, I mean, Groucho Marx lived in, on an American film, and so all of a sudden you're bringing back, you know, Elvis. It's just, you're like, no, dude, he's Elvis. You don't, like, it's, it's I get that it's out there and crazy. Um, but we've got, uh, uh, even there's an opening montage where we go over his desk as well, and we see the, the famous clarinet that he's always learning how to play. He's got a galleon, like a ship in a bottle that he's always trying to build, but he never finishes from the comic book. All that's in there, and so we really wanted to try to tie in the fact that all of those adventures that were in the comic book happened, and now he just moved to New Orleans. And where the future goes from there, I don't know. It could be going back to London. It could be anything. But that world, this movie was never meant to negate all the events that already had happened. So it was sort of trying to encompass them. So. Why Brandon? Why Brandon? Yeah. It's funny. Brandon was um, the one casting that was already done whenever I oh. joined, but I would tell you that I would cast him again because I met with him for five minutes, and I just thought he was sort of that perfect mix of... He was the movie version of that of that character, and, and I, I thought he had a quiet stillness to him that I thought was really important to the character in terms of he just comes off as very self-assured when he's in those situations. And, and this character is someone who's more, um, more at ease with monsters than he is with human beings. And so, and uh, not that that's Brandon, but you need someone who has that sort of like ease of communication and, and being in a room and, and being able to sit there and have like a heart-to-heart with a werewolf knowing that he could rip your head off at any moment. And Brandon just had that. And then Sam came along, and um, I had looked through a bunch of old casting tapes that Platinum had, and uh, and the one that jumped out from a couple of years earlier was was Sam. And and I was meeting with Brandon on like a weekly basis. We were meeting like at some hotel in, in L.A. And um, and I was like, oh, it's just a shame that you know Sam's really not your real friend because you guys would be really good together. And he was like, dude, he's my best friend. And I was like, oh my god, we have to meet him. And so we brought Sam in, and and. As soon as they sat down, he started. They started ribbing each other the way that like friends do, and uh, and then you just knew right away that was it. Just had to be that. And both of them elevated each other's performances, which I thought was great. And it is the core of the movie, which is and that's the thing that, regardless of details like white or black cars or you know what make of you know gun he fires, which is actually true to what he shoots in the comic book. But um, like it matters. But um, but it's uh, <laughs> but it's but it, that's the thing that really carries on, and that's that's the franchise to me. So. What sort of education needs to be done for audiences who aren't already familiar with Dylan Dog to let them know? I went in with the idea that there shouldn't be any education for them. I think they need to... I think the only education they need to do is to watch the trailer or hear the premise and say, I could see how that could be fun. And that's that's pretty much it. I, I it, the, the, the point wasn't to water it down, necessarily, you know, and to the point where it's, it's so accessible for everybody. I mean, because it's a very specific audience as well, even though we're still trying to cast as broad of a net as possible. I mean, people who are into, like, action, horror, comedy things set w- against a world of real rubber suit monsters. I mean, that's not... I mean, it's everybody who's in this building today, which is really cool. And so that's sort of the audience that I really want to play to. And is the action part really action-packed? Is the action part... Um, th- there's bursts of it, you know, as, yeah, and as much as it can. It's one of these... You know, it's... it's I put action and I put um, uh, monster transformation sort of in the same category uh, in that... Everyone's seen it done really well. Everyone's seen it done really expensively. Everyone's seen it done really poorly. Everybody gets that those moments have to happen. And I just really wanted to make this movie focus on the characters in the sense that if he is going to be in a fight, how would he fight? And so there's things like from an Italian audience that would say, oh, he's shooting guns in all the trailers and the real Dylan would never shoot a gun. He's never actually firing a real actual bullet at, at, at somebody else. He's shooting flare guns that are shooting like magnesium flares that burn vampires with the same intensity of sunlight. He's shooting wood tip bullets. He has dum dums for zombies. He's got all these things. So the idea is, if there's action, it's, it has to sort of still be driven by comedy. So we try to still do that ramp where you know your action beats get bigger and bigger throughout the movie. 